Ladies and gentlemen, let me call everybody to order since we have limited time uh, and uh, a very wonderful speaker with us uh, now this evening. So I'll give only a brief uh, introduction uh, and then Tom Graham will speak uh, for as long as he speaks and there will be a bit of time for, uh, for questions and answers and of course much more time this evening to continue the conversation uh, informally. Tom Graham is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and also a lecturer at the Macmillan Center at Yale uh, University. I'm happy to offer this bit of advertising for Tom Graham's forthcoming book titled Getting Russia Right. And if you want to hear his rather spectacular translation of this title into Russian, you'll have to ask him for it. It's, uh, um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, one of many reasons why it would be interesting to see this book appear uh, in Russian. But this book is going to be coming out with Polity Press uh, in October uh, of this year. So it's certainly something to look out for, to mention only, uh, again, in brief uh, stages along the way of Tom Graham's uh, career. Uh, he was at the NSC between 2004 and 2007, dealing with issues related to Russia and the former Soviet Union. Uh, Tom Graham has also served at Embassy Moscow uh, and at various postings in the State Department. I'll make, make only three extremely brief points about uh, the career of Tom Graham, sort of the three points that I see as most uh, significant. Uh, I think it's self-evident that Tom Graham is among the leading interpreters uh, of Russia and the Soviet Union in the United States. Uh, and you know, this ranges from many, many pieces on Russia, but also a piece, I think, about a week ago in the New York Times uh, on Belarus and many others uh, on uh, the region, you know, sort of uh, the lucidity, but also the depth of, of knowledge and learning is always uh, very notable about this, uh, this aspect uh, of, uh, of Tom's career. I would say also that there is uh, another point. Uh, Tom Graham is a strategic thinker, and so there is a regional focus to be sure, but there's also a sense of what American diplomacy should look like writ large, American foreign policy, what its agendas should be, what its priorities should be, uh, and where the former Soviet Union fits uh, within that larger story uh, of the American national interest and uh, its uh, strategic imperatives. And thirdly, and I would say maybe from my vantage point, most importantly, but equally importantly perhaps, uh, I think of Tom Graham as a teacher. It's, it's of course wonderful that the students at Yale get access to him, but I think he's a teacher to many of us who work uh, in this area, telling us what it is to interpret countries other than one's own, uh, helping us to understand the art uh, and the science uh, of diplomacy, uh, and how to balance uh, the, uh, the interests uh, of one's uh, own country uh, with the complicated dynamics of the outside world. It's not an easy job, uh, and uh, I think that uh, what Tom Graham does is to teach us how to do it, so it's especially appropriate in this guise of, of teacher, diplomat, uh, and strategic thinker that we have time with us for the uh, summer symposium uh, this evening and for the next couple of days. And so with that, the floor is yours, Tom, and I'll return just to moderate the questions. Thank you very much, Michael, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here with all of you and in person. Uh, this is the first time we've done this in four years, if I counted correctly. Uh, but it really makes for a much more pleasant interaction when we can uh, see each other face to face. Um, tremendous thanks to Anna uh, for, for putting this together. She's really been a stalwart supporter uh, of, this, of this program and along with her colleagues makes this all possible and did a tremendous job during the pandemic in holding this all together and then bringing us to Yerevan uh, and Tbilisi. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, for your your commitment to uh, to this symposium, uh, you know, I was going to start by saying uh, that I always feel like I'm an interloper when I come to a a session like this, because I see around me a number of great academics, real intellectuals, uh, and I'm pretty much a denizen of the policy world. And the policy world is much different from the academic world. Um, I'm reminded immediately, uh, just to show that I know a little bit about the academic studies, of the 11th thesis of Feuerbach, um, where uh, you know, he makes the, the point that philosophers 
uh, merely interpret the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And that is what policymaking is about. It's about action, about getting things done. Uh, and it is a different type of mindset uh, from, the, uh, from what you have in the academic world. Uh, often you hear that in the policy world, uh, you have to act under extreme time pressure and incomplete knowledge. Uh, and that means that in many ways, uh, what you, when you look at a very complex situation, what you're trying to do is simplify it uh, to make it manageable so that you can act effectively. Uh, and then you base your actions on a very few key essential uh, ideas about how the world operates, what your country is about, and the foreign lands that you deal with. Uh, again, very different from the academic world. You want to put this in sort of very sort of crude <coughs> uh, ways, in a crude way. I mean, in the academic world, uh, you're supposed to be uh, looking for the truth, right? For however long it takes. Uh, that's the essence of a real academic. Uh, in the policy world, what you do is you don't look for the truth. You create facts um, uh, for your own sort of momentary advantage and hope that the facts that you create uh, last long enough so that you can act again in a pur purposeful fashion. <clears throat> you find that it's very difficult for academics to adjust to the policy world, uh, in part because uh, of your own training. And most academics that I know, Michael being an exception, uh, who have uh, entered the policy world find it very uncomfortable uh, for that reason. Uh, policymakers, by and large, when they enter the academic world, you usually do that post policymaking, um, don't really become academics. We're known as practitioners. Um, don't know exactly what that means, uh, but we're supposed to teach students how to act, uh, forget about the theory, this, that, and the other thing. So, very two different worlds. Um, and I come from the policy world and not really from the academic world. So I'm thinking in terms of what needs to be done uh, and how you get it done. Uh, the second thing I wanted to do uh, was to provide a, something that I don't do often, but I think is appropriate at this point, is to provide a sort of personal uh, reflection at where we are uh, and how we think about Russia at this point. Um, an experience that that perhaps many of you have had against the background of what has occurred since February 24th of last year. My sojourn with Russia uh, began in 1957 uh, with the launch of the Sputnik satellite. Um, I remember being a very young boy, uh, being taken by the satellite. Uh, you could actually buy a balloon with four straws into it, painted silver, fill it with helium, uh, and call it a Sputnik. Uh, but I remember uh, the, the chatter among the adults at that time that there was something serious and that it created problems for the United States. And that's what sparked my interest uh, in, in Russia. A uh, very uh, opportune time since the Soviet Union was just beginning to open up with the United States. Our first exchange programs, uh, people who participated in that coming back and writing stories about what it was like uh, to live in the Soviet Union. Uh, this continued through high school, university, uh, and then into government service, uh, which I started 40 years ago uh, this fall. Almost all of this focused on, uh, on the Soviet Union uh, and Russia. Uh, I like to tell people that the first part of my diplomatic career, when I served in the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1990, was really the most successful part of my career since I helped break down the Soviet Union, right? A little help from uh, my Russian friends, or Ukrainians, Armenians, and so forth. Uh, but after that, my real job, uh, both in government and out of government, was to build constructive relations between the United States and Russia. Um, and that has not been as rousing success as the initial part of my. Uh, but what I like to say is that, you know, over those years um, that I've gotten to know and interacted with dozens, if not hundreds, of Russians, uh, government officials, Duma deputies, uh, foreign policy experts, journalists, 
uh, many cultural fig figures. I had the tremendous advantage of having a wife who was a cultural affairs officer uh, at our embassy in Moscow. So um, my evenings were filled with other things than simply contemplating uh, the political situation uh, in Russia at that, uh, at that time. Uh, and almost all the Russians that I've encountered in my years, I thought of as decent individuals, thoughtful, really a lot of fun uh, to be with, and I learned a lot from them. Um, and now we have this act of aggression uh, on, on the part of, uh, of Russia, uh, a very brutal uh, conflict in Ukraine. And I struggle, and I think uh, many of us struggle, to reconcile uh, what we see happening uh, in the name of Russia with, with the Russians that we know personally. Uh, and it raises a whole host of sort of ethical and practical questions of to what extent uh, should we keep faith with our Russian friends at this very difficult time, uh, knowing that uh, many of them uh, probably feel as we do about what is going on in the world. Um, to what extent uh, can you absolve your friends of responsibility if they occupy uh, senior Russian government positions and remain in those positions to cite the conflict? And what do we do about those friends that we've developed over the years that have become ardent, uh, ardent supporters uh, of, the, of the conflict uh, on the Russian side? Uh, many individuals who actually participated, I think, quite, um, quite successfully in the symposium over the years. Uh, and beyond that, uh, can we hope, uh, what can we hope for the future uh, in this relationship? Uh, is there a way we can move beyond uh, what is happening now, reconnect in ways uh, that will lead to constructive uh, relations between our two countries? Uh, or is that something in the past? Um, and so uh, I find myself, uh, when talking about Russia, uh, in many ways, uh, there's always this twinge of, uh, of depression. Um, uh, as I said, uh, that the greater part of 40 years of my life uh, working towards building constructive relations with, uh, with Russia and seeing that sort of collapse in dust and barbarity in a few short months over the past year. Um, the, the problem uh, is that uh, more so than in the past, I find that my own emotional reaction uh, to what's going on colors the way I think about, uh, about Russia. Anyone who has done analysis uh, over the years and has done it seriously knows that to be a good analyst, uh, you have to put emotions to the side. Uh, you have to look at Russia plainly, without sentiment and without prejudice. Uh, and if you can't do that, uh, then you always have to question the quality of your analysis. Uh, so that uh, uh, is something that I think about a lot um, uh, as I try to uh, write and speak about Russia. Uh, there is a very good reason uh, why the U.S. government, at least in theory, uh, tries to separate the analytical world from the policy world. Um, our uh, analytical agencies, the intelligence community, is not supposed to engage in policy making. Uh, good intelligence, good analysis is supposed to inform the policy maker. Uh, we don't want political ambitions uh, twisting the, anal the analysis uh, for, uh, for political goals. Uh, when that has happened, it almost always leads to ruin. And we've seen that in the United States uh, in the recent past. I, one word sort of sums it up, Iraq. Um, uh, but it is something that I think is uh, extremely difficult to do under current circumstances. Uh, in any event, with that, um, with that introduction, let me get on to what's supposed to be uh, the topic of the discussion tonight, which is imagining uh, US, uh, future U.S.-Russian relations. Now, there are two questions uh, that we have to pose uh, before we get to um, the uh, quality of U.S.-Russian relations or where we want to take the relationship. Uh, and the first is uh, the question of what type of Russia are we going to face uh, over, the longer, uh, over the longer term? Uh, and the second is what type of Russia does the United States need? 
So let me start with the first question. Um, I think it's very apropos at this moment because of all the, um, uh, the dialogue, the discussion surrounding the, 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 the uh, Prigozhin affair. Now, put crudely, I think that um, uh, the discussion in the United States uh, has boiled down to uh, two, um, two points that are now uh, more or less conventional uh, wisdom. The first is that uh, Putin was seriously damaged uh, by the Pogosian affair, uh, and that is going to uh, lead to his early political demise. Uh, the second, and related to that, uh, is that the possibility uh, of the collapse of Russia, the Russian Federation, is increasingly likely. And I think both of those uh, assumptions are off the mark. Um, and I'd just like to go into a uh, briefly to, uh, to say why. Uh, first, I think it's quite clear uh, that Prigozhin did surprise uh, the, uh, the Kremlin. Um, it did raise questions within the broader political elite about the quality of Putin's leadership going forward. But it's also important to remember that it failed, and it failed quite quickly. Uh, and I think because Prigozhin came to the conclusion that he lacked the uh, support both within the elites and within the public at large in order to succeed, um, whatever it was to succeed. I don't even believe he had a, a firm idea about what that, uh, what success really was in his own mind. You get the troops to Moscow and then what do you do? Um, I don't know if he had thought that through. Uh, and what we've seen over the past a couple of weeks is, is Putin shoring up his, his position, uh, both with security elites, uh, and in particular uh, with the public at large, uh, the broader political elites. So contrary to um, what a lot of people are speculating about now, I don't think Prigozhin is going to inspire a lot of copycats. Um, I think what he's demonstrated uh, is really the difficulty uh, of effectively uh, altering the, uh, the Russian system, of ousting Putin at this point. Uh, um, and I see no reason why other people, despite all the uh, discontent that we know that it exists within the Russian public, within the elite, uh, despite what might be going on on the conflict on the ground uh, in Ukraine, uh, that a lot of people are going to jump to say that this is the time to, to gather up a, a bunch of armed men and march on Moscow. Uh, I think Prigozhin has taught people who are dissatisfied uh, with the Kremlin that would like to see a change in leadership uh, of one thing, and that is that you need allies. And you need allies in the key parts of the elite if you're going to succeed in some fashion. And second, that the task is not simply ousting Putin. Uh, the task is but more complicated than that, and that is doing that and still stabilizing the system. Uh, you can oust Putin, uh, but if you don't do that properly, uh, what you do uh, is collapse the entire system. I think of Putin as sitting at the center of a very vast uh, patronage network. If you pull him out uh, without a substitute, the whole web of this, of this relationship collapses on itself. If you do it right, uh, and put a, an individual in Putin's place uh, that has sufficient uh, elite support, then the web uh, basically stays intact. Even it shifts shape, it shifts its shape slightly uh, because of uh, uh, some different elements <clears throat> and different types of personal relationships that will emerge because of that. Uh, the practical question then is how would you do that under current circumstances? How in the system that we know exists in Russia under Putin, a very repressive system, would you even go about uh, conspiring uh, with some sort of sense that you can do this and not be uncovered uh, before the, uh, the moment of launching uh, the conspiracy is supposed to take place? Who do you have to have on your side? 
who might those individuals be? How do you identify them? How do you make initial contact? What risk are you prepared uh, to run in order to do this? Um, you look at uh, the situation in Russia, uh, and you would say, well, this is an, uh, an improbable task. It's certainly not for the faint-hearted, and it's not for the impulsive. But it's also important to remember that it's not an impossible task. Uh, and in fact, we have a precedent um, uh, from 1964 uh, of how you uh, should do this properly. Uh, a conspiracy uh, that removed Khrushchev, but put in place uh, someone in his position, but a collective leadership of some sort, that it, in fact stabilized the system uh, and allowed the system uh, to survive into the, into the 1970s, it fell apart for, for, for different reasons, but not because of what they did in 1964. And I think 1964 uh, is the example that we, uh, with, that we ought to be studying uh, to think about how this change might be, uh, come about in Russia and not so, spend so much time on the failed coups. Um, favorite dates are 1605, 1917, and 1991. Uh, which are really uh, examples of um, almost impulsive uh, mutinies of some sort that really had very little chance uh, of success. Um, so I think that um, uh, you know it is possible that we'll see leadership change, but not probable in the near in the near term. We'll be dealing with Putin now. As far as collapse is concerned, uh, I think that's even less uh, likely. Uh, in a medium, in the near term and the medium term. Uh, you can think uh, of uh, that during a period of significant instability that follows leadership change of certain parts of Russia uh, breaking away. Kaliningrad, Exclave, for example, Chechnya, or other, uh, some other uh, ethnic republic in the North Caucasus. Uh, but those types of losses uh, are hardly the collapse of the of the uh, of the Russian state. The Russian state would still con, uh, control a vast amount of territory, still have a tremendous amount of power. Uh, moreover, uh, I think if you look at uh, Russia today, I think it's much different from the Soviet Union in the uh, late 1980s. Um, this is a country where there are significant centripetal forces that are holding the country together. Uh, patriotism is part of that. Uh, xenophobia of a sort uh, is part of that. Uh, there are supply chains, uh, critical infrastructure that hold the country together. Uh, and there are also the security services, uh, which I think very clearly want to avail themselves of the resources of the entire country. This is much different from what the situation was uh, like in the, in the late Soviet period. Uh, you do have um, sort of significant ethnic minorities. The Tatars come to mind right away. Uh, there are whips of separatism, uh, certainly in the North Caucasus, but you, uh, you get it in Tatarstan from time to time. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the important fact is that the overwhelming majority of the Russian population is ethnically Russian, 70 to 75% um, now. I think if you look at uh, the history of the past 200 years, I think it's quite clear that ethnically homogenous states rarely if ever fall apart uh, for internal reasons. Uh, in fact, the only example I can think of where it came close to happening and the real historians in the room will correct me, um, and again with some qualifications, was the United States in the 1860s. Um, and we fought a bloody, war, bloody civil war to prevent that from happening. Now, I know the historians will say that, well, I think homogenous, but then, you know, there's a lot of other factors involved there. But nevertheless, I mean, if you look around the globe, uh, ethnically homogenous states uh, usually fall prey to outside powers uh, and not to internal. Uh, not in, to internal factors. Um, so again, I think that the near-term removal of Putin, uh, a near medium-term collapse of the uh, Russian state, and the long-term collapse of the Russian state are quite improbable. 
Um, and what we're going to see uh, over the next 10, uh, 15, maybe 20 years uh, is a Russia, with or without Putin, uh, that is going to be some recognizable version of it, of, its histor of the historical Russia. And that is it's going to be authoritarian uh, in its domestic politics. It is going to be expansionary um, in its foreign policy, at least uh, with uh, expansionary impulses. It's going to be lagging economically and technologically behind the leading powers, and yet is going to insist that it's a great power. It's still going to have that great power mindset. Uh, and even a Russia uh, that is defeated uh, in Ukraine, something that is far from sure if we look at um, uh, the slow progress that is being made by uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive at this point, uh, if you think about the resources that Russia, or at least Putin, I think much of the Russian political elite at this point is still prepared to commit um, uh, to this conflict. It's far from certain that they will be defeated. But even if they are defeated, it's still going to be a country that occupies a vast territory, has the richest endowment of natural resources in the world, has the world's largest nuclear arsenal, and still has a permanent veto welding seat on the UN Security Council. Uh, it's a country that the United States is not going to be able to ignore. It's a country that the United States is going to have to learn to live with uh, in the future. Uh, and the question really is uh, how the United States is going to uh, go about doing that. Now, what type of uh, Russia does the United States need? Uh, we are now um, in a period of, I think, hard-edged containment uh, of Russia. We're seeking to isolate uh, and cripple Russia, uh, to weaken Russia, so that Russia will never be able to pose uh, the same type of threat that uh, is posing to European security at this moment. Uh, but there are dangers uh, in weakening Russia beyond, beyond a certain uh, a certain threshold. Uh, and if you do that, you resurrect all those worries that uh, we had at the end of the Soviet period, uh, things that exercised the greatly of uh, the George H.W. Bush administration uh, and uh, led that administration to believe that holding the Soviet Union intact uh, was actually uh, to the United States' advantage. Little that the administration could do, but you'll remember the chicken uh, Kiev speech uh, where Bush uh, traveled to Kiev to warn the Ukrainians against um, a local nationalism uh, to get away from a, a far off, um, uh, a far off um, imperial, uh, imperial rule, in part because he didn't want the Soviet Union to break up. Uh, you look at this, I think, from the standpoint of U.S. national interests, we need a Russia that is strong enough, first and foremost, to reliably command and control its nuclear arsenal, its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. We need a Russia that is sufficiently strong to govern its own territory effectively so that instability in, regional, uh, in regions along the periphery doesn't spill over uh, into other areas. We need a Russia that is sufficiently strong now uh, in order to, uh, to undertake obligations to deal with urgent uh, international, uh, transnational issues, climate change in particular, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, international terrorism, and so forth. Uh, but importantly, I think we also need uh, a Russia uh, that is strong enough um, to act as a significant power uh, in creating regional balances uh, all along its periphery uh, on this large Eurasian air mass, land mass in, in Europe, uh, in the Far East, uh, in South and Central Asia, and in the Arctic, um, that are potentially favorable uh, to the United States. This is a long, or, or to put it, uh, I think, quite succinctly, the United States, in fact, if it looks at its own interest uh, objectively, needs Russia as a major power 
as a major power with strategic autonomy. That is a country that conducts uh, its foreign policy in the pursuit of its national interest, um, and that the United States has some interest uh, in ensuring uh, that Russia uh, does remain uh, a country with strategic autonomy going forward. Uh, now, I think it's, uh, you could make an argument, and a good argument, um, that Russia uh, has worked very hard since the breakup of the Soviet Union, first to regain its strategic autonomy and then to preserve it. Initially, the real challenge <clears throat> came from the West, the United States, first of all. Uh, and Russia uh, found itself excessive, excessively dependent on the United States uh, and the West uh, for its financial wherewithal, uh, for its security. Um, it was found that the United States uh, and other Western countries were shamelessly interfering in, in, in Russian domestic politics uh, at that point. Uh, and it worked hard to find a, a counterweight to the United States. Um, there was a little bit of, uh, of work with the, the Germans and the French. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, in the late Yeltsin period, but going into the Putin period in particular, saw so that um, 2003 with the Iraq War, um, the alignment with the, the French and the Germans in, in opposition to that. You saw that again in 2008, question of Ukrainian and, and Georgian membership. Uh, and NATO, where the Germans uh, uh, and the French were, were opposed. Um, the Russians also uh, developed a closer working relationship with, with China. Uh, but China really didn't become a, much of a factor uh, until the later, latter part of the 2000s. Um, in the 1990s, China itself was very dependent on the goodwill of the United States uh, as it entered a period of very robust uh, economic growth. But it's only, I think, by uh, when, when Putin returns to power in, uh, in 2012 that he thinks he has found the counterweight that he needs to the United States. Uh, and that is not so much in Europe. That is China uh, writ large. And we've seen a growing uh, strategic alignment between those, uh, uh, those two countries from the moment Putin returns to the Kremlin in 2012, uh, accelerated by the events of 2014, uh, the uh, Russian seizure uh, of Crimea, the fomenting of uh, unrest in, uh, in eastern Ukraine, and then the diplomatic isolation uh, from the West, uh, the sanctions from the West in response. The problem now is that having regained uh, strategic autonomy uh, in the 2010s, that Russia is now in danger of losing that strategic autonomy uh, to China. And that's despite the fact that, to, uh, that Putin touts this as one of the great achievements uh, of Russian foreign policy over the past decade. Um, it's clear that these countries not only have had a, uh, a long history of troubled relations <clears throat> that could reappear at any moment in the future, uh, but that the countries are traveling are traveling two radically different trajectories. Uh, and there's a tremendous asymmetry in fortune and power that tilts in China's favor. One factoid that I think speaks volumes uh, about the relationship uh, of these two countries and the, where, uh, and the way things are headed. Uh, in the early 1990s, the Chinese economy and the Russian economy were roughly the same size. Today, the Chinese economy, again, depending on how you measure it, is roughly 10 times the size of the Russian economy and that gap is only going to grow in the future. Uh, we've seen China uh, leap to the forefront of technological innovation uh, in those technologies that are going to define power in the future, AI in particular, robotics, uh, and we can go down, uh, go down the list. Uh, the Chinese uh, in the past year have landed uh, a satellite on the back uh, of the moon first country to do that. The Chinese do things in space now that the Russians could do 50 years ago, but are incapable of doing today. So that gives you a sense uh, of uh, the relationship between these two countries 
and why, if you were in, uh, in Moscow, you would be looking for uh, a strategic counterweight in order to maintain your strategic autonomy going forward. If you don't have the alternative of the West, uh, then where do you turn? Putin would argue uh, that we're going to build this counterweight to China, although he wouldn't say this publicly and not to Xi Jinping's face, uh, but this is what he's thinking, is we're going to build this in Eurasia, in the global south. Uh, and we're going to do that in part by repurposing those institutions that we built uh, over the past several decades. Think of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS uh, as a financial uh, entity. Uh, and use these to create an entangling web of relationships that will constrain China going forward. I think the problem with that and the harsh reality that Russia has to face is that you're not going to be able to construct an effective, reliable counterweight among the countries of Eurasia or the global south. They simply don't have uh, the economic wherewithal, the military prowess, the technological skills provide Russia uh, what it needs uh, over the long term. Uh, and fortunately or not for Russia, uh, the only real option uh, for a counterweight remains the collective West led by the United States. Now, Putin is not going to consider that option. Uh, his anti-Americanism, I think, is too deeply embedded in his psyche at this point. He's too closely tied uh, politically with Xi Jinping uh, for him to consider that and to move away uh, to rebuild a relationship with the United States, even if it's strategically beneficial. Uh, but that's not necessarily the view uh, of many other Russians, uh, future Russian leaders. I don't think that's necessarily the view uh, of many of the people uh, in the second and third echelons of key Russian elites, including in the special services in the military uh, and, and in the government, uh, who can look out over the next 15, 20 years uh, and realize the problems uh, and the downsides uh, of the course that Putin has taken the country on at this point. Um, and we'll be willing to consider a Western option if it looked favorable. The challenge for the United States uh, is to uh, be able to present that uh, strategic option to Russian leaders in a way that Russians would find acceptable going forward. And I think the United States needs to do that for its own advantage. Uh, first and foremost, from the standpoint of, uh, of U.S. interests, um, helping Russia regain strategic autonomy brings us a tremendous benefit uh, in what is going to be a long competitive challenge from China, it's something that they think about in Washington all the time, although they don't rarely think about the Russian element uh, to this. Uh, China has benefited tremendously from Russia's isolation from the West uh, and in the development of the strategic alliance. It has exploited Russia's weakness to gain the, act, the resources it needs to enhance its own capabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States going forward. Um, it gets the natural resources it needs uh, for its robustly growing economy, or what they hope will continue to be a robustly growing economy, uh, in ways that can't be interdicted by the U.S. Navy. Uh, they get them at knockdown prices because Russia can't sell uh, except to a limited uh, range of, uh, of countries, think particularly of energy, um, gas, uh, where if you can't sell it into Europe, um, you know, you sell it to, uh, to China, the Chinese are smart enough to realize that, uh, and they'll always get it at knockdown prices. Uh, the Chinese also get from Russia increasingly sophisticated military equipment, uh, advanced weaponry that the Chinese are not capable, as of yet, of building on their own. Um, they are going to get a, uh, an early warning system for ballistic missiles uh, that the Russians are going to help them uh, construct. And when that is completed uh, in a few short years, that will make China only the third country in the world to have such a system. The other two countries being Russia and the United States. And because of this strategic relationship, 
uh, with Russia because of the calm that this brings along this long border uh, in the north, because the Chinese really don't have many worries about Russia's strategic intent going forward. Um, they can devote even greater resources to dealing what they see with, as their major challenge in the Indo-Pacific region, and that, again, is with the United States. Um, by giving Russia, or helping Russia regain its strategic autonomy, we're not going to break this relationship uh, between Russia and China. The good strategic reasons why Russia would still want to enjoy uh, good relations with China. But what we will do uh, is ensure that any deals uh, that Russia cuts with China, whether they be geopolitical, political, economic, or technological, won't be tilted nearly as much in favor of China as they are at this point. That, I would argue, uh, is a small but si nevertheless significant benefit for the United States. Beyond, uh, uh, beyond this, I think you will also find that a Russia with strategic autonomy raises the possibility for a number of interesting diplomatic and commercial combinations in such areas as Central Asia, Northeast Asia, and the Arctic that can also be advantageous to the United States over the long run. These types of combinations will almost certainly complicate Chinese strategic calculations, even if they're not necessarily directed against China. You can imagine uh, a number of situations in which China would be part of the coalitions that you're building along with Russia and other countries to deal with issues like climate change, the proliferations uh, of weapons of mass destruction, and so forth. But the important, uh, I think, point for, uh, for the United States uh, is that uh, Russia with strategic autonomy will assure uh, uh, the United States that China can exploit Russia's weakness uh, to help build these areas, these regions, Central Asia, Northeast Asia, the Arctic, uh, in ways that are detrimental to the United States, uh, something that is much less likely uh, if Russia remains very strongly in China's embrace. Um, so those are the benefits. Um, I think something worth thinking about. The question then becomes, how do you make um, uh, this offer of strategic autonomy of the, of the Western option um, attractive to Russia uh, if your goal remains supporting Ukrainian independence uh, and supporting European security against Russia? How can you encourage Russian strategic autonomy? How can you back Russia without jeopardizing uh, your interest in Ukraine and Europe more broadly construed? Uh, I think the uh, the way I answer that question for myself, and it's something that needs to be developed uh, as going forward, is that you know clearly we still need to be united uh, with our allies and partners uh, on the Ukrainian issue. Uh, we still need to, to back Ukraine. Uh, we need to see <clears throat> uh, battlefield success on the part of the Ukrainians. Uh, but in a situation like that, Instead of moving towards um, total victory, of uh, inflicting a humiliating defeat on, uh, on Russia, which is what many people uh, in Washington, and certainly many people uh, in Eastern Europe would want, uh, that the United States uh, would back away from that uh, and convey to the Russian side that there is an alternative, that the United States is prepared to deal in a constructive fashion with Russia's legitimate security concerns, uh, that the United States is prepared to expeditiously, expeditiously lift sanctions against Russia in response uh, to certain Russian actions, and that the United States is prepared to help Russia restore its commercial and economic relations with Europe and the West more broadly cons uh, construed. Uh, and there's a lot that we, have to, we can offer in that regard. Uh, on the issues of Russian security, uh, we can resurrect uh, the CFE Treaty, the INF Treaty, the Open Skies Treaties, uh, adapted to uh, the new realities, uh, but in ways uh, that should offer Russia 
uh, a sense, a greater sense of its own security, um, as they did during the uh, during the Cold War. We can support um, uh, the restoration of a Russian role in, uh, uh, in European energy markets, and I think there are many countries in Europe that would want to do that. Clearly, uh, though, short of the uh, the level of dependence uh, that we saw. Um, uh, you know, prior to uh, Russia's action against Ukraine, uh, but nevertheless something that um, will provide Russia uh, with the, the counterbalance is now growing excessive reliance on China uh, in energy exports. And there are a host of other things that we can do uh, that will restore this relationship uh, in a way that is beneficial to Russia, uh, but also beneficial uh, to Europe and broader uh, uh, American national interest. Now, I think it's clear that uh, if the United States moves in that direction, uh, there's going to be a huge outcry uh, in certain circles. Certainly in Europe, the Balts, the Poles, the Ukrainians uh, will see this as appeasement of some sort. Uh, there are clearly domestic constituency, constituencies in the United States that will agree uh, that uh, see Russia as a pers persistent threat uh, as um, you know, the Biden administration now describes Russia, uh, and think that total victory um, is the only acceptable outcome uh, for this conflict. That also um, plays uh, well in the American psychology, because we like to think that we always win wars when we win them uh, in total victory, World War II being the, uh, the prime example. The first Iraq war is good, the second not so good um, in that regard. We'll talk about Afghanistan. Uh, and so, the, you know, so an administration will have to push back against that. Uh, the point I would make, and here I'll close, uh, is that I think the United States needs to come uh, to, uh, to the recognition uh, that total victory in Europe carries um, downsides for U.S. interests elsewhere in the world. The United States cannot look at Russia simply through the European prism, uh, something that we tend to do, uh, have tended to do, and continue uh, to do to the present. We need to have a global vision, and we need to understand that Russia plays a different role in various parts of Eurasia. Um, certainly, uh, it's one role in Europe, uh, but when you look in the, uh, the Far East, the Arctic, uh, Central and South Asia. Uh, I think it's an entirely different role. Uh, and as I said, it can be managed in ways that are beneficial uh, to the United States. Uh, final point. Uh, for many, many years, um, the United States has been concerned about Russian power. Even when we had little respect for Russia and Russian power, we were always concerned about Russia regaining its power. Uh, I think it's time for the United States to finally come uh, to terms with the fact that Russian power is not necessarily malevolent or malicious from the standpoint of U.S. interests. The goal is not to prevent Russia from becoming powerful, regaining its power. Rather, the challenge before the United States is to harness Russian power, uh, Russian ambitions to American purpose their own uh, goals and ambitions around the world. And we do that largely by using Russia uh, to build regional balances of power uh, that favor the United States all uh, along Russia's long periphery in Eurasia. Um, it's something that we can do. It's something that the United States has not wanted to do. Um, but I would argue as a far superior power it's something that we can do um, if we put our minds to it, and that the ultimate the outcome of that will be a world that is better organized from the standpoint of American interest and probably more secure and more stable uh, than the world that we're heading into at the moment. So let me end there.